afternoon, everyone. I'm Kelly Testy, the president of the Law School Admission Council, and I'm here with Ken Randall from ILA and Barbary. And this is the monthly Live with Kelly and Ken show. And uh, we're just delighted to be bringing this to you today from the Association of American Law Schools annual meeting in New Orleans. Uh, it's great to be here with so many of the Legal Academy and talking about all the issues that are important for justice and the rule of law. And uh, being here with uh, five terrific deans to talk about our subject today of law and technology. So I want to uh, begin today by first of all thanking all the deans for being here. I'm going to let you know who we have with us. And the way we're going to proceed is they're going to provide some opening comments and then Ken's going to moderate a little bit of a Q&A and we'll take some questions from the audience, both the audience in the room and the great audience out there on the online and uh, have a conversation about law and technology because this is an area that's just really been changing and moving so much and presenting a lot of opportunities and challenges for law and legal education. So I want to uh, introduce the deans who are here. I'm going to start closest to me, uh, Harry Asofsky from Penn State. I also have Andy Perlman from Suffolk, Song Richardson from UC Irvine, and next to her, Megan Carpenter from New Hampshire, and Anthony Nidwicki from Golden Gate. And uh, these five deans are just terrific leaders for legal ed and have done so much for their schools and for legal ed broadly to uh, help us all move forward well together. And each has been active in their own way at the intersection of law and technology and has a lot to, to share with us today. So I'm going to basically call on you in reverse order and Anthony have you start and uh, come down this way and open us up with some, you know, three or four minutes of opening comments about you know, what are you seeing? There's a lot of issues in practice. There's a lot of issues in your school. People mean a lot of different things when they say law and technology. So just some opening comments from each of you, if you could. Yeah, sure. Um, this is, we were originally asked to kind of think about what was practice like back in our days and how are things changed a little bit. Um, and I'm going to date myself probably uh, a little bit here, but in the mid-90s is when I practiced. And it was, at that time, there was going to be some changes uh, on the cusp. Um, you know, email was more prevalent. The internet still wasn't as uh, used as much as it is today. Um, but um, you look at 1995 when I practiced, and then you look 10 years ago, and you look today, and how things have changed so much. And really how law schools have to adapt to this. Um, um, some of the changes, you know, are, are pretty obvious that you see, like I said, the internet, email. But some of them are a little bit more um, complicated and present its own set of issues that we at law schools have to kind of think about. Um, number one, technology as it relates to uh, documents and how we actually communicate. E-discovery has become an area that has expanded tremendously um, um, over the last decade or so. And it wasn't even something that was anything we discussed. It was something that was very confusing. You know, as a first or second year attorney, um, your job was to look at documents, basically. It's like that's all you did, document, document, documents. Um, and for the first time in, uh, when I started, it was the first time that they were actually scanning documents uh, to put in to search um, and then indexing them. And the big discussion then was the dis how much it was going to cost to do this type of thing. Now that's just second nature. Um, the other thing is I remember going into some of our client's office and thinking about um, they were doing email and I had no idea how do we search for email and what do we provide in dis uh, under these discovery requests. So the, you know, there's been a big, huge change in, in those areas. Um, but I think two of the biggest changes that I think present some of the biggest issues for law schools for us is um, case management and using case management software that wasn't necessarily available to us when we practiced, um, and how case management systems are, are in the cloud. And that presents its own unique issues. So a lot of clinics are using Clio or other uh, products that provide um, access anywhere you go um, to cases. And so that provides a, a learning opportunity for us at law schools on how to deal with that. The second thing is legal research and the access to information um, and how that's changed so much. Um, not only back in 95, you were discouraged from using online um, sources because it was so costly. 
10 years ago, it became, I mean, back then you had to put a disc in, you had all this other stuff you had to do, and then 10 years ago, you know, it moved to be uh, internet-based. But now I think the complications for law schools and research is dealing with, um, they, I like to say, Google-fied, you know, uh, the search on Westlaw and Lexis. They use these search engines that um, take a little bit of the control away from researchers and then again that raises professional responsibility issues as it with, with the students because of, of that with that less control and so you know a lot of things are changing I've only mentioned a couple things um, but there's a lot of big changes that have both changed forced us to rethink things in law school uh, to respond to these changes but also to be mindful of um, <coughs> professional responsibility issues thank you very much uh, Megan well, my area um, of practice is intellectual property, which has changed enormously since I started practicing in the late 90s. Because it, you know, it's the legal framework where we deal with human creativity and innovation. And so, as you can imagine, um, you know, that area of law has transformed enormously. I remember you know, at the time, um, you know, there were cases coming out saying that there would be infringement where both companies advertised on the internet because you know, that put them really close. And that's something that's really unfathomable now when we think about you know, the internet and technology um, as a tool that is really just part of our daily lives that, that we incorporate into many different activities. And you know, intellectual property isn't an area of the law that one pursues if one likes stasis. Um, and so sometimes I think I should have studied, you know, feudal property law or something <laughs> where you, you learn it and then you're done. Um, but I remember at the time spending many hours as a young associate, you know, poring over um, websites to determine, you know, infringement. So surf, I guess surfing the internet for the billable hour, which um, was sometimes enjoyable. Um, um, but now I think we, you know, young associates or, or junior associates are not experiencing um, that kind of technology. They aren't, I was the sort of the tool myself. I was the tool. Um, and, and so <laughs> now we have junior associates that are um, learning to use separate tools of technology um, and that as um, institutions of legal education and as we think about how best to educate our students to prepare them for practice, now we have to really think about not just teaching them the substantive law and how to do the legal analysis that I was so focused on in, when I first started practicing, but how to utilize technological tools um, to, um, to, to even begin to assess information. And so I think that, that in itself has been an enormous transformation over the last you know, 20 or 25 years. I think that also leads us to a question of technology and legal education and, and how that has changed over, over time. And we at, at the University of New Hampshire have focused in part on our library as we think about how to use technology and legal education and what that means. And we've, we've had for many years a, an information literacy requirement as part of all of our, our, our first year courses and our upper, upper level courses. But the question of what information literacy was five years ago or 10 years ago um, is very different from what information literacy might be now. And even in today's political and cultural climate, not just with technological developments, but thinking about assessing the veracity of information and what is a fact and, and um, the, engaging in that level of analysis is something that um, we are really excited to wrestle with, but continue to wrestle with on, on a daily basis. So those are just two maybe aspects of practice and, and legal ed that, that I'm thinking about right now. Thank you so much. And uh, this will probably reveal a little more about how long I've been in the academy than anything, but your comments about the transformation remind me that I was part of a faculty conversation once about should we start an institute for internet law? <laughs> and uh, I can only imagine it would be kind of like teaching American law right, today, right. Right? Yeah. something yeah. like that. It's great. Um, Song Richardson from UC Irvine, your opening comments. First, thank you so much for having me on the show, and it's such a pleasure to be on this panel with my fellow deans. 
So when I think about law and technology, and when we think about law and technology at UC Irvine, I primarily focus uh, attention on artificial intelligence. So by artificial intelligence, no one really knows what does that really mean. So when I use that phrase, I'm talking about cognitive computing, uh, machine learning, big data, all of the ways in which technologies can now go from the first grade, le first grade level to basically PhD level um, in a week or less. And in thinking about the impact that artificial technologies will have on the legal profession, we've spent quite a bit of time speaking to law firms, speaking to judges, policymakers, and our faculty and our <laughs> students. Because our goal is to think to the future and determine what is it that we should be teaching our students in addition to the core curriculum that which they will obviously still need to prepare them from the world that they'll be entering. So for instance, to give an example of what I mean by that, there's an Orange County law firm and lawyer that's created a program using artificial intelligence called Legal Mation. And what Legal Mation does is it can do the first drafts, and actually great first drafts of legal pleadings in personal injury and employment cases. Uh, I saw this, um, this, this, this uh, artificial intelligence system at work recently, and it, within five minutes, it was able to create legal pleadings that may have taken a first or second year associate a week. That will change the way that law firms operate. Uh, what we've noticed in uh, Orange County is that there are three groups of law firms. There are those that are burying their heads in the sand and hoping that these changes aren't coming. <laughs> right? And then there are those who are at the cutting edge, like the one who developed this program, LegalMation. And then there are those in the middle with this wait and see attitude. But if these artificial technologies really do take off, and they already are, I shouldn't even say really do take off because they're already being created. So many new systems are being created. It will fundamentally change the way that big law firms work. So thinking back then to the law school, what can we do at UCI to prepare our students for the world that they're going to enter? And one of the things that we're starting to do now is in all of our classes. We're not gonna create, we will, we have special classes that deal specifically with uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. I'll be teaching one in the spring with one of the developers of the Watson computer because we want our students to begin learning how to speak this language. But we don't wanna have just one class. So in all of our first year classes, we intend to have part of the curriculum in contracts towards criminal procedure, criminal law, start addressing the ways that these new technologies, and again, I'm talking about cognitive computing and artificial intelligence, how they should change or how they might change the way that we think about every area of the law because it does impact every aspect of the law. We're also working with law firms and with judges so that we can start demystifying the ways that these technologies work because the fear of not understanding how these technologies work are impacting the policies, the ethical judgments we make, the laws that are being made because these technologies are moving so quickly that law, ethics, uh, policies are just not keeping pace. So I think that is one of the challenges that we have as we think about educating our students. How do we make them more aware of the ways that technology is impacting every aspect of the legal profession in both positive ways and in negative ways. Thank you, Song, and it's, uh, it's exciting for the students. You know, I, I see we have a lot of admission deans in the room, and I know a lot of our candidates, you know, mm -hmm. listen to the, the uh, podcast every month, and I've been sharing that, you know, it makes it exciting because it leaves then room to do the creative work exactly. of lawyering that a lot of us enjoy so much. Exactly. So it's great to hear some of that, uh, that change that's happening. Andy, I want to turn to you. You've been uh, really a leader at the forefront of this area, so I'd love, love to hear some opening comments. Yeah, thank you, and thanks for the invitation. Sure. One of the challenges of speaking forth with this esteemed group is it doesn't leave much <laughs> for me to say. Um, uh, so what I thought might be useful is at the outset to try to categorize some of the ideas that we've heard so far. Um, and I, the way that I've heard it expressed, and I think this is valuable, 
is thinking about the distinction between the <coughs> law of technology and the technology of law practice. And some of the ideas that have come out so far fall into both of those categories. So I heard, Megan, when you were talking about intellectual property law. That's the law of technology. Song, when you were talking about uh, issues of uh, uh, automation and the use of Watson or data privacy, those are also the law of technology. But you're also, I think all three of you are picking up on something else, which is the technology of law practice. That is, how is technology being used to deliver legal services in new ways? And that, those are both important. Uh, both are being dramatically impacted by the development of technology, but they are, in fact, a little bit uh, distinct. I'm going to talk more about the second category, the, the uh, technology of law practice, and start by kind of taking us back 100 years ago and thinking about the way legal services were delivered back then. They were largely bespoke, and by that I mean a client would come into a lawyer's office uh, and ask for a solution to a legal problem, and the solution was crafted in a very bespoke, custom-tailored way for that particular client. And that has been our model of lawyering, really, from that point up until very recently. And what's changed over the last decade is that the use of technology is allowing us to deliver legal services in ways that are better, faster, and cheaper. And it's impacting a lot of areas. Anthony mentioned uh, discovery. We're of a similar vintage. I started off going page by page through documents uh, in the discovery process. Due diligence and corporate work was similar. Um, uh, Song, you mentioned document creation and this interesting company uh, that has emerged that is helping people automate the creation <coughs> of legal information. So we're seeing basic documents that you went being written by hand to typewriters to word processing, now to automated document assembly. We've seen discovery go from a manual process to an automated process through electronic discovery. Um, and many more changes are emerging. One of the big points that I'd like to make is, and this wouldn't seem at first blush to be very significant, is a transition of the way that lawyers charge for their work. Mm -hmm. A movement away from billable hours towards fixed fee work. When we started off, at least many of us, almost all of the work being done by lawyers, especially in the larger firms, were by the hour. And the reason that that's significant is it doesn't give you an enormous incentive to become more efficient. Uh, but now clients are putting a lot of pressure on lawyers uh, to move to AFAs, alternative fee arrangements. Uh, a great example here is Microsoft announcing that within a couple of years, 90% of its work will be alternative fee arrangements rather than by the hour. And when I talk with law firm partners, they're telling me that an increasing percentage of their work is AFAs. Now, the reason this is significant is that it's going to create industry-wide pressure to find new ways to deliver services, better, faster, and especially cheaper ways to do it. Uh, and that's where all these technologies come into play and why our graduates are going to be uh, needing uh, to prepare for that market and why new jobs are emerging like legal solutions architects, legal project managers, automated document uh, assembly specialists, alternative legal services providers. All of these solutions are emerging. Um, so uh, just very quickly, and I can get into it more later, one thing that we've done at Suffolk is create an institute on legal innovation and technology. We have a concentration where we're teaching students the kinds of knowledge and skills that they're going to need to be able to enter this marketplace successfully. So if we have time later, I can get into some more of those details about what exactly we're doing. That's great, thank you. And that, that dichotomy is real helpful too in understanding that we mean a lot of different things when we talk about law and technology. Hari, I want to turn to you. I know you've also been leading a group that's uh, of deans and of others who are working you know, on these areas. So love to hear some opening comments from, from your perspective. Great. Well, um, thank you so much for including me in this dialogue, and it's so exciting to be talking with all of these deep tech leaders. Um, you know, I, I think what's very clear from the remarks of all of my colleagues is we are at a moment of immense social change in which technology and globalization and the need for cross-cutting knowledge are fundamentally transforming the practice of law, who needs legal okay. services and information, and what that all looks like. And in, we're going to prepare our students for that world, how we do legal education has to change. And we're hearing about these different forms of innovation um, from, from everybody who, who went before me. And, and what I'd really like to highlight um, are a couple of things that, that, that were, I think, latent in those comments, um, but, I, but, I, but I think are worth noting, which is that I think part of what has to happen in the way in which we go about educating our students is greater interdisciplinarity 
greater modularity, and stronger partnerships with both technology and, and law firms to think creatively about how to do this. And so I thought I might highlight, in my opening remarks, three examples of how we're up to this at Penn State Law, which is um, in University Park and connected to this, this, this dean's group that, that, that um, Kelly was mentioning. So um, most core to the conversation we've already been having, um, we've launched over the last year and a half something called the Legal Tech Virtual Lab. And the idea there is that artificial intelligence and machine learning, 3D printing, blockchain, cryptocurrency, um, this whole set of technologies, they're, they're fundamentally changing the practice of law um, and raising big legal issues, the dichotomy that Andy just, just highlighted. Um, and so the first thing we started to do is think about what does it mean to prepare our students for the legal technology in, in practice side? Um, and so we first started with some pop-ups with some of these AI-powered companies like Song was, was referencing. So we had Ross Intelligence come in, which has an AI-powered legal research tool. And we had Legal Sifter come in, which does AI contract analysis. Um, and we're having an e-discovery company, Blue Star coming in, and Preseritas is coming in, um, and Microsoft is coming in. And what we, what we came to think about is um, the fact that, in fact, when you talk about preparing our students for technology skills for practice, it's not simply, you know, these, you know, we're not simply talking about this cutting edge AI, but we're also talking about really basic technology skills, like can you use Microsoft Office? Can you use Lexis and, and Westlaw? Out to e-discovery, out to the cutting edge AI tools. And so what, we're, what we actually have done is, is, is created, a, we've um, created a contract with Preseritas, which does tech assessment. So part of what we're trying to do is bring an assessment of, of what technology knowledge our students have in all of these different ways um, into our classroom. So some of it's being brought directly into classes. Some of it we're going to give our students kind of individualized opportunities to use. Um, and all of that thinking um, led me to start sitting down with tech leaders and, and, and law firm leaders in major cities. We've done them in, in Pittsburgh and New York so far and, are, and have one planned in Texas in January to really brainstorm with them and say, okay, you know, I'm hearing um, that from partners, I'm hearing from people in companies that students aren't coming out of law school prepared. They're not coming out prepared for what they actually need to do in practice. And I said, so what does that look like? How could a law school partner with you to come up with what it means to be prepared and to teach some of those problem solving skills and the technology skills and the business skills and what does that look like, right? Because the technology questions intertwine with that. The lab is also gonna train students across Penn State in the legal issues around this technology. Um, and, and also we're, we're gonna partner with a um, a, a future center in immersive technology at the university to create innovative learning experiences. So imagine you go to crim law and you go to a virtual crime scene. Um, and as, as we were trying to think about all this stuff, I wanted to learn from other deans because I think what's really critical is that we not reinvent these wheels separately but we learn from one another. And so we've had this group of deans meeting monthly now and we're bringing in some of our technology leaders to really learn from each other and think about these questions like artificial intelligence and technology assessment and, and all of that. The second thing I wanted to highlight because we ha hasn't really come up much is online education. I know we'll talk about that more later. Um, but one of the things I wanted to highlight is that I think when people talk about online ed, they're mostly talking about how do you take a traditional JD course and put it online? Or how do you create a master's program for LLMs or for, for, for US students? Um, but one of the things that I think um, needs to happen in that space is we need to think in more modular and interdisciplinary terms. So we have a pilot with World Campus, Penn State's online campus, to create modular online courses aimed at non-lawyers and lawyers who want to know a little bit about an area of law. And we're creating courses to go into interdisciplinary master's programs. Um, we're also thinking beyond just the ACE, a the asynchronous online ed to the synchronous online ed. So we have advanced distance learning technology. How can we use that, right? So we have a program called Externships Everywhere where our students can go anywhere in the world and beam back in for class um, and also um, you know, are using it in virtual conferencing like the, the SALT AALS tech section. But the final thing I wanted to highlight about interdisciplinarity um, is that I think um, one of the problems with legal education is that 
we tend to have law schools that are really isolated from their universities. But in fact, when we look at problem solving, we need cross-cutting knowledge. And so one of the things that I think we have the opportunity to do in law schools is to really more deeply, and, and we're experimenting with this question of what if you fully embed a law school in a university? What could that look like? How do you actually make education better through doing that? And I'll just give you one quick example, because I know I need to wrap up, which is, so we have a partnership between my two schools and, and the College of Engineering. Um, in order to think about law policy and engineering, but not just in the patent law space where it's typically thought about, but we just did a symposium on election security where we brought in sort of the computer science experts and the legal and policy experts together. We have a partnership on autonomous vehicles, um, and we're, we're planning to do a comprehensive set of educational programs and research partnerships in this space. And so I think part of where legal education needs to go to prepare our graduates is to give them the cross-cutting knowledge that they need in order to really solve the problems that are pressing and facing our world today. Thank you so much. All your comments are just a great start. And I want to thank you for all the focus on students, you know, thinking about what they're going to need, not the first year they graduate, but how about the next, you know, five and decades ahead. Um, I want to also say that one of the issues that a lot of your comments have highlighted is, is the issue of access and equity when we talk about technology. And I know I'm going to turn it over to Ken in a minute. We can cover some of this in our questions, but it's really what led LSAC when we were looking around for a partner in technology to uh, join up with Microsoft in <clears throat> delivering the LSAT, uh, but also because they are very interested in the way that technology can actually even the playing field and, and that there's, all, there's some issues there around equity and access that we all need to think about. So I'm hopeful that as we continue our discussion that one of the benefits of all of us working together is that it's more of a collective approach that might help everyone a little bit more and, uh, and bring some of those issues to the forefront. But Ken, I know you've got a number of questions, so I'm <laughs> going to get out of the way for a minute and let you, uh, you know, you've, you've had some experience with technology and education, so. Thanks, guys. Yeah. So, so wonderful comments. Thank you so much. And I, I pre-scripted uh, questions. I'm going to throw them all away because this has just been so stimulating. So I want to <laughs> pick up a little bit on, on a theme that Hari mentioned and then go dean by dean and ask questions. So, Hari is right, when we talk about online legal education, typically we're talking about something that I think is actually rather conservative and not particularly inventive. And that is, you know, how much do you, should you uh, take things that we've been doing in a traditional classroom and, and put it online? And, you know, I think that's, you know, I've got ideas on that and, um, you know, sometimes I think I'm a little further thinking about that, but it, they're, they're still taking old wine and putting it in a new flask. That's not particularly you know, that's fascinating to me. So I want to ask you this question. It, um, we know that at, at law schools, deans and faculty share jurisdiction. But if you as dean were really the person who could make one recommendation, one big picture change at your law school, things that really would need approval, like the number of students that you graduate given the changes in the academy, or how long does the JD take, or do you change the basic structure of the curriculum or do we move away from the core JD to other licensing, like they've done in, in you know, Kelly's uh, state of Washington? You know, what's the most significant change? You know, if you could be, say, rather than dean for a day, king or queen for a day, <laughs> what would it be that you'd bring to your faculty that you think is most pressing? And would we'll go in the same order, Anthony? Yeah, you know, it's interesting that you asked that question because we're really kind of in these types of discussions about what does the future law school look like in a lot of ways. Being in San Francisco, it's a center of innovation, so we're surrounded by um, companies, tech firms, and stuff that think differently than we do. I had a really enlightening conversation with somebody from uh, Wells Fargo, and um, who works there high up in their, the, the, the bank there. They solve problems differently than we've ever done before, and they have an innovation center. And so they identify a problem <coughs> at the bank, and then they bring lawyers, tech people, accountants, bankers, everybody into a room and say, you're working together no longer in your department until you solve this problem. Um, and so it's requiring people to do a lot more interdisciplinary thinking. Mm -hmm. And so um, in, in San Francisco, the, the market has changed so much. We don't see this huge growth in law firms in, in your uh, typical types of, of jobs um, for lawyers. What we're seeing a big increase is, is lawyers going and working in these tech companies. That's where the jobs are um, for our students. 
And so when we've talked to people um, in, in the city about what they would want our students to have, they're looking for somebody who has basic understanding of business and technology. And so one of the big moves we made at Golden Gate this year is that we brought in a program from one of the other schools in the city, um, the McCarthy Institute, but we made it an interdisciplinary program that was a joint project with the business school, the law school, and technology. And it's really focused on those areas. So if I were to make one of the biggest changes in something I'm talking about with the business school, is taking the third year and having these joint classes that are business students, law students, um, in the same classes that are geared around technology and solving some of the, and talking about some of the, the main issues that we're doing. We have our first um, business law class this semester coming up where it's a compliance course, but it's gonna be half business students, and uh, MBA students, and half law students. Um, and the Wells Fargo person I talked about um, is, is in there and it's being taught by her and also a law professor who does business law. Doing more of those um, courses where it's really mimicking what practice looks like, especially in the tech area where, where our, our students are gonna go to work, I think would be the right. big thing. Yeah, I mean, that's so refreshing because deans are spending so much time on, when it comes to career services, how many uh, students are in jobs where there is JDs required and JDs preferred, and instead you're looking at it in a much more creative way about what's really needed uh, to practice. Megan? I'm so excited about getting to be queen for a day. <laughs> I was trying to boil it down to one thing. Only a day. <laughs> for one thing, too. Um, okay, so I think that law schools, we in legal education, have been in a silo or an ivory tower or however you want to define it for a long time, but at our peril. Legal education has so many different forms and components and needs and we all worry about, we have worried for the last several years about you know, fewer people applying to law school. But the need for knowledge about the law is everywhere and it is greater than it's ever been. We really need to take the lead on this as leaders in legal education, to democratize legal education, to say, to modularize it, to make it interdisciplinary, to unbundle it in all its forms and to get it to the people who need it. And some of those people will need JDs. Some of them will need graduate degrees, but some of them might need other forms of, of legal education. Um, you know, and I think if we, as we seek to redefine legal ed, we can take some lessons from some of the innovative companies like Wells Fargo or startups that are thinking about um, using design thinking principles to really sort of um, figure out from a human-centered, user-centered, um, profession-centered perspective um, what our students need to truly succeed in, in the profession. So when you think about design from just the, a standpoint of you know, designing a chair, 30 or 40 years ago, you designed a chair according to you know, the average size of people's rear ends and, and you know, it had to have four legs, so it had to sit there. But now we understand that um, being able to sit their component, their ergonomic components, pleasure components, um, aspects that we really need to think about what the needs of the user of that chair are. And I think that's what we need to do in education as well for students and for professions. We had, a, I was talking with um, um, one of our grads um, who is a managing partner of a, of a large firm now, and he was saying, you know, we need, stu um, you know, we need graduates who understand, you know, the business of law and the business of firms and, and trying to incorporate those kinds of interdisciplinary components, I think, within our law schools presents an incredible opportunity for us. People are gonna get legal education, whether they get it on the internet or wherever they're gonna get it. Let's be leaders of that and really seek to break down these barriers and these silos and take legal education to the masses in whatever form they need it in. Great, great, okay, I'm voting for you. <laughs> you can stay for a whole week. So, uh, <clears throat> so I, I agree with what's already been said, both in answer to this question and the last one, especially about the importance of interdisciplinary education and law. 
Uh, and so when you ask about what would I love to do at UCI, the difficulty I have in answering that question is, and maybe it's because we're such a new school, we're only 10 years old now, there is nothing that I can come up with that our faculty say no to. Yeah. Great. I mean, it is amazing. And so the things that I have already mentioned during the talk, and, and UCI itself is so interdisciplinary that we're already members of other departments and they come to our school. and all, So all of those things are there. And so I'm going to change your question just a Absolutely. little bit to say, to broaden it a little bit, because it's also hard to talk about what are the things that we want to do at our individual schools when there are so many other structural constraints that keep us from doing some of those things. So Washington State yeah. is doing incredible work now, right? right? Because you can get an alternate practice, yeah. alternative practice license. US News and World Report is something that many law schools remain tied to that really make it difficult for us to bring in the types of students we might want, to educate a broader group of people, to think outside of the box about what legal education should be and could be. And so there are lots of things that I would love to do at UCI and so many things that I think we need to do to prepare our students and the world, frankly, right, mm -hmm. for the changes that are occurring. And yet, at the law school level, I feel very constrained when I start thinking about it, not because of UCI law, but because right. of the other external things that we need to also think about. So I would love at some point to have that conversation, but great. this is not the panel. <laughs> yeah, no, great, no, no, great, great perspective. Lots of other limitations and things. Andy. I think we may have a consensus on the I word of interdisciplinarity. Um, I would want to focus on one aspect of it, uh, which is the way that I think about it is a new kind of issue spotting. That I would love for our students to be able to solve problems by identifying a different kind of issue. So we traditionally train law students to be able to spot legal issues of various kinds in various uh, doctrinal areas. What I would love to be able to do through interdisciplinary work with other schools and other professionals is for our students when they, or in our graduates, when they encounter a problem that a client has, to be able to spot the ways in which that problem could be solved in a better, faster, or cheaper way. Uh, and that necessarily draws on lots of different disciplines, lots of other kinds of professionals. So uh, a couple of examples of the ways in which we're doing that at Suffolk, I briefly mentioned our concentration in legal innovation technology where students are learning design thinking, which has already been mentioned, project management, process improvement. Uh, we've got technologists, data scientists teaching our students. We have a legal innovation and technology lab that reimagines what a clinical program can be about. So rather than representing a client in a typical one-on-one -on -one type of bespoke situation, we're representing organizations like a legal aid office, a government agency, a corporate legal department, or a law firm, and helping those organizations rethink how they are delivering their services so that they can do it more efficiently. So the students are taking what they're learning in the classroom, the inter inter interdisciplinary work, and then applying it in practice. Then we have legal innovation and technology fellows who are embedded inside of our clinical programs to help our traditional clinics reimagine the way that they go about their work. So this is interdisciplinary uh, work in action. Now the challenge, of course, uh, all of this has been created on a kind of parallel track to our traditional curriculum. Uh, students can opt into it. It's not required. So if I could wave my magic wand and make one change, I would love to bring more of this kind of interdisciplinary thinking, this kind of training into the core uh, mandatory curriculum. I can see in just about every doctrinal course embedding this kind of knowledge and skill set and new kind of issue spotting in a way that I think will ultimately ensure that our graduates are more successful in the 21st century marketplace. Great, wonderful, thank you. Ari? So I want to echo Song that I feel incredibly lucky to be at an institution where I'm thinking collaboratively with our faculty and staff about what it means to do legal education for a changing society, but also lucky to be at a university that has a really strong culture of collaborativeness um, deans who really play well together, a provost who really encourages that, and a president. And, um, and I, I think that's actually, and a, and a strategic goal of the university to impact the world. Um, and, and so in terms of waving my magic wand, um, I think there, there are three different concentric circles I wanna think about. So one is the JD itself. Um, and I think that the JD itself 
Um, one of the, the issues that we have is on the one hand, I think it's crucially important that we pre prepare our students to pass their licensing exam. And I've been, been really proud of, of kind of the success we've, we've had at that. Um, but I think it's also critically important to prepare our students for the professions they're going to enter. And I don't know that our licensing exams always are testing the skills that our students need in practice. And, and I know that's been a huge conversation in California um, uh, that, that Song's participated in. And so, um, and so I think part of it is we need to think really hard about what skills our law students need that aren't just law skills. Um, because when I talk to law firm partners, as I, as I said before, and to, to people in the industry, what I hear about why they think, what they need students to be more prepared for is problem solving. Mm -hmm. And problem solving seems to be a mix of being able to think in these cross-cutting interdisciplinary ways. That's part of why I think bringing in the interdisciplinarity is crucial. It's about business acumen. It's about emotional intelligence and leadership skills. It's about a whole bunch of different things. And so I think part of what we need to do with the JD is we need to bring in that kind of learning for our students to prepare them to succeed in the, in the diverse professions they're going to enter. I also agree completely with Megan um, that part of what we need to also be thinking about is I think in part because law schools are framed around JDs and an accreditation process around JDs, we haven't thought creatively enough about what are the different kinds of legal education that people need beyond the JD. Um, and so, you know, as, as I talked about before, you know, I think beyond just master's programs, and by the way, not just master's programs law schools teach, but for example, the master's we're planning to launch based in engineering that will be a master's in engineering law and policy, right? So, so there's still those traditional master's and certificates, but I think the more we can think in modular terms about providing education um, that is in the small bites that sometimes people need, that it becomes part of continuing education for people, not just continuing legal education, but continuing education is important. And that leads to my third point, which connects to Kelly's question about access to justice. I, we have a profound access to justice crisis in this country. And in some ways, though technology is talked about as a panacea, and all of these legal tech companies talk about how they're, they're helping, in fact, we also have to think about the fact that if we look at access to technology, there's a huge justice gap also. So, so, so poor people, um, don't often have access to technology, right? And there's a race class confluence there. And so in order for these technological solutions to work for them, they have to actually have access to the technology in the first place. And so I think part of what we need to be doing in law schools, part of the leadership role we can play in law schools in the broader profession, is to think creatively about how technology can be a tool in access to justice um, by giving people access to things you know, that, that, that make them more effective pro se, for example, but, but also um, how we can make sure we give access to the technology to people that allows them to have access to these new tools. Great, thank you. Appreciate that. <clears throat> and we're getting close to the amount of time. These have been some great comments. So I'm gonna throw a question out and maybe we can also use it as sort of our, our closing. Great. Uh, that um, when we think about uh, online legal education, we typically, since 2002, have been framing it as uh, a quote standard 306 issue, right? How many credits can you do online? How do you achieve interactivity? When can you do those credits? Um, each dean is, is that, and uh, uh, forgive me, you probably have to limit this to about 60 seconds or so each. Is that the right way to be thinking about this? Um, should we allow all credits to be taken online or hybrid or residential? Or flipped in the other way, are there other restrictions or expectations that we should impose on law schools? So in other words, for you to be accredited, you actually have to provide some of the things that the deans have been talking about this afternoon. So again, we'll go in the same order. Yeah, that's a, that's a difficult one in some <laughs> ways. Uh, but also, I, I think we have to think of technology just like we would in any other uh, solution. Is, is it, it, can we use technology in a way that better educates our students or does it in an efficient way? We've all talked about all these new ideas, but how do you do all these things when we have the pressure of California Bar, you know, where right. we have to concentrate so much on that? How can we actually serve our students in a more efficient way um, using technology as opposed to just thinking, let's put it online for convenience, but what are, because I think there's ways that we can do things online that would better educate our students in some areas 
than doing it live or doing it in some other way. Using gaming theory, using other uh, ways of thinking about um, uh, putting forward, you know, learning. Great. Thanks. Megan? I'll talk really fast. Um, I, have, <laughs> I absolutely agree, and I think that you know we've gotten to the point where we know that technology can be used effectively in legal education. So for me, it's like the old intellectual property cases of saying, you know, oh, it's infringing because both companies advertise on the internet. It's that we need to move beyond the kind of you know number of hours that can be distance learning, and to think about leveraging technologies in ways that benefit our students. So we're launching um, a, a certificate, a professional certificate for lawyers and non-lawyers alike that's on sports wagering and integrity. And so it's, it focuses on sports betting, but one of the most amazing things about it is, you know, one of our faculty members is, he's also the legal analyst for Sports Illustrated. So he's, he has the expertise um, and, you know, teaches in the space, but then we're able to bring in industry contacts of all kinds <laughs> to really, you know, lawyers for, you know, for the NBA, all kinds of different people. Also, gambling um, addict experts, you know, sort of not experts in being addicted to gambling, <laughs> but thinking about the psychology of addiction and, and sort of taking all different sides of, of this issue. And so we're able to offer students that enroll in the certificate the kind of education without using technology we would never be able to do to do that otherwise. So we can leverage um, you know, true expertise of all kinds and bring them into New Hampshire um, where none of these people are actually located in New Hampshire. Another thing we're doing, I'll be really fast, is that, um, you know, we've had a top 10 program in intellectual property for, you know, the last 30 years or so. And so we are using, putting our intellectual property program online and offering it to other law schools. So maybe if you're at a school that, that you would like to bring in a top IP program, some classes here or there, maybe somebody's visiting and you want to bring something in, then you can actually subscribe, you can bring the, our classes into your law school and offer it to your students. We would love to do that for other law schools. We have lots of areas that um, uh, you know, if you have an area of expertise, we'd love for our students to be able to take your classes as well. So let's break down all of these barriers, leverage our collective strengths. And so I just want to challenge us to think beyond our silos and to beyond the kind of competition that schools have traditionally had and think about ways we can work together for the benefit of students. Um, across disciplines. Okay. Wonderful. Thanks, Megan. Thanks wow. very much. Well said. If I could so, just say ditto, ditto. <laughs> <laughs> to both of the things that have, have been said, and I'll, I'll just reiterate the fact that I think thinking about credit hours when it comes to online education is something that we should move beyond uh, because there are so many ways, I think, that we can use and harness the power of technologies that we don't, we haven't even done yet. It, it is, is part of um, uh, what, what I wanted to say. And in addition to that, there are, so should we use online and other sorts of technologies to teach our students? 100% yes. But the thing that we should <coughs> care about is there are some atrocious online programs too. So really the, the issue for me is what are the types of online programs or other technologies are people using and are those programs and tools and the way they're teaching actually working? That, that's the question that, that right. To that focus on quality. Exactly. Absolutely. So okay. I agree with Song completely that we should be moving beyond this idea that, of regulating the number of credits that law schools can offer online. I think the better approach is to think about it from an output perspective. That is, uh, are there students gaining meaningful employment? Are they able to pass the bar at a reasonable percentage? Yeah. Focus on what really matters, whether a class is taken online or in person shouldn't be the focus of regulatory attention, in, in my view. Song's point, I think she's exactly right. You can find some really atrocious courses that are delivered online, but guess what? You can have some really atrocious courses that are del delivered in person. Um, that too. So I, I don't think that's really the, it, we, what we should focus on are, are our students learning? Are they getting what they need to receive in terms of knowledge and skills to be successful? And you can, there are various measures to do that. Uh, that should be the focus of regulatory attention, not how many credits of online classes you offer. 
Yeah, great, thank you. And how are you So I concur with my <laughs> colleagues, um, but I, I come, I'm a little bit unusually situated in that um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, Penn State has two law schools, um, and I became the dean of Penn State Law as the separation of our law school completed. So during the time we were a unified school, before I was dean, um, we actually had a variance from the ABA to use um, synchronous technology. And, um, and, and really, uh, you know, our outcomes were exactly the same as a school that was not using synchronous technology, right? It was, it was the regular classroom, but we were using like three screens in all of our classrooms to incorporate people from two campuses. I do think that that's a different, a different story, and that's one of the things we've been talking about all along. Be, you know, using technology in the ways that we've always done legal education is different from some of these innovations that we're talking about. And so I think the key question for our regulators, right, should be about the quality question, about bar passage, about, um, you know, outcomes, right? And, and so to me, when you look at what we need for outcomes, right, we have to do traditional legal education well to make sure our students pass the bar examinations. We also have to do all of these innovations that we're talking about in order to prepare our students for the changing marketplace that they will enter. And so I think it's crucial that we think in both and terms and we think about technology as an important complement and an important component of what the future of legal education will be. Thank you so much. So I'll close this out really with just three quick points. The first one is I'm so glad you're all deans. Uh, <laughs> this, is a, this is a great conversation and I, I think we should have a maybe a second round on Law and Technology Canada at a future uh, event because there's a lot to talk about. And uh, I really love hearing this idea that it's not an either or, that those, those problem solving skills that law schools have always been known for, you know, that ability to, as we say, see around corners, you know. I know when we launched the free LSAT prep with the Khan Academy, Saul said, I've never seen a better, you know, test of being able to really solve problems critically. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I think we just have so much to talk about in terms of being able to put this together so that we're really making sure that we're educating students for the world that they're going to be, to be in. So a future, a future topic, sure. I think, for follow-up. Um, the other thing that I wanted to let everyone know is that we do do this monthly. And, uh, and so next month we've chosen the topic of financing legal education because obviously cost is a huge issue and when you're talking about some of the issues we've been discussing that you know raises issues of cost too when it's a hands-on and more intensive form of education so I hope those of you who are here and who are listening online will tune in in February uh, for a robust discussion about financing legal education and the cost and then I uh, want to just close out by again thanking the deans for their leadership and for this great conversation thanking my partner Ken it's always a pleasure to, uh, for LSAC to work with ILAW to bring this forward. And we thank everybody for watching and wish you a great day.